chapter. Please turn the pages of your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Now we, um, in the previous weeks, have just started this series called The Language of Salvation. The Language of Salvation. And we described it as looking at a diamond. It's beautiful. But there are many facets to this gemstone that looking at it from all the different aspects allows one to see its true beauty. And salvation is like that. Sadly, we use a lot of words synonymously thinking they all mean the same thing, even though they are closely related and some of it do overlap. But I think we as Christians in the church are more the poorer for not fully understanding what all these words and these terms mean. And our hope is as we go through this series, The Language of Salvation, that you and I will come to appreciate even more this great salvation that God, through His Son, has procured and secured for us. We will be looking at terms such, well, we looked last week at regeneration, and to see how this, these words are, are um, is languages employed from other areas of life that the Bible writers of God is using to convey a particular aspect of this saving work. Last week we looked at regeneration, which we said is the language of biology, it's creation language. When you look at it, it's meant to convey, it's meant to remind you of God's creating act back in Genesis. It's meant to convey to you and I that of bringing forth a new child. And we said the regeneration doctrine addresses and deals with man's problem of his sinful nature. That you and I, by nature, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 3, by nature we are children of wrath. That's who we are. And how do we change that? We need to be born again. We need to be born from above. We need, we need new birth. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Behold, if you are in Christ, you are what? A new creation. And all of this is meant to convey to us the imagery of, remember, we were made in God's image, but that image became marred because of sin. And we, Colossians tells us, are recreated in the image of Christ. Amen. So this morning we will be looking at the language of the courtroom justification, but we're going to be looking at adoption, redemption, I mean, what do we even mean by citizenship, union in Christ, all these terms, they're wonderful terms, but they're not all primarily religious words. That redemption, I can't wait to get to redemption, it's an amazing term. It wasn't originally a religious word, but it's a word that's used from the marketplace. So this morning, we will be concentrating on justification. You've heard this term many times, but I want us to look a bit deeper this morning. And I'm hoping, not only will you say it's a nice sermon or, hmm, that's, that's interesting, but the, the hope and the, the purpose of this series is that you and I will walk out of here understanding better than we did before of all that Christ has done for us. We don't need to go chasing some prophet or some other teaching or sensationalism. My prayer is that we will realize that we, this salvation is complete. That's what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. 
people are trying to destabilize their faith, telling them that they still needed something more. And we see that today. Yeah, the salvation week is fine, but you need this. And Paul writes to the church in Colossae and says, we have an amazing savior who's given us an amazing salvation. It's complete, it's finished, it's clear, you need nothing else. But do you believe that? And if you say yes, then I need to ask you the next question. Are you living as if this is the truth? The language of the courtroom, from guilt to acquittal. That's what we'll be looking at this morning. Let's read Romans chapter 3, verse 27 and verse 28. Romans chapter 3, verse 27 and 28. And it reads, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. There is a story of a king. And one day, this king, usually at least three times a week, holds court to decide over um, judicial matters of his kingdom. And one particular day, a woman was dragged into his court accused of stealing something very, very precious from the king's treasury. And the king had decreed that when anyone steals, their right hand should be removed. And the woman was brought before the king. And the king asked the woman and said, Woman, is this true? And the woman confessed and said, it is so. She did steal that which is accused of taking. And the king looked at the woman and said, but mother, why? Now the king had the following options. Either to execute the punishment decreed by his own hand or the law of the land that anyone found stealing should have their right hand removed. That was his first option, that his mother's hand be removed. Or he could let his mother, because it's his mother, go free. But you see, he would have a problem, wouldn't he? And the problem is this. If he let her off because she's his mother he would be considered a corrupt king. He would be considered an unjust king. He would be considered to be partial in his judgment. And this would quite bring questions on his integrity as a king and ultimately demonstrate to the subjects in his kingdom that his decree it's not worth anything. Those are the two main options before him. Chop off his, his mother's right hand or let her go free. But he chose a third option. He stood up from his throne. He took off his cloak. And he walked down to the chopping block. And he put his own hand on the block. And told him to remove his right hand. People are usually offended by the Christians or what they see as Christianity's preoccupation with sin. All you people talk about sin, 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 sin. The Christian's conviction that we are all sinners in need of forgiveness and, in, and thus, because of that, deserving of punishment, of judgment offends many non-believers. 
the gospel will preach by its very nature condemns all men as sinners. Church, when we verbalize God's saving work in our lives, what we, we say things like, Jesus died for my sins, don't we? Or we say, Jesus saved me from my sin. And there's nothing wrong with these terms, it's right. But the world has a problem with it. Because we condemn them rightly as sinners. Sadly, sadly, many churches believe preaching about sin is bad for business. So you know what they do? They avoid preaching about it altogether. Preaching about sin and God's judgment is seen as turning people away. You need to attract people. You need to focus on this, focus on that. More lights, more music. Just love them as they are. But don't speak about sin. You see, there is no gospel apart from addressing sin. Church, it is impossible to share the gospel and not address the matter of sin. If you preach a gospel without addressing the matter of sin, you're preaching gospel zero or gospel light. So this morning, God willing, we will first of all consider the biblical language of justification. What does it mean? You've heard it. You kind of know what it is, and I'm sure you could probably describe it, but I, I fear there's many facets to this doctrine of justification that we miss out on. Also, we will consider how we should understand this in the context of Christian salvation. This is very important. And thirdly, hopefully, and this is very important, church, how does a holy God, listen very carefully, how does a holy and just God allow sinners to be justified without paying for their sins? Have you ever sat down to think about that? How? 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 Well, let's first consider what this word justification means. What does it mean? Now, when we say someone is just or to be just, what we're saying is that person is morally right. Oh, William is a just man. We're saying he's a morally right man. Aren't you, William? When we say someone's just, we're speaking about that person's um, good standing morally. God is described in Scripture as just. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, please. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 reads, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. We see also in Acts chapter 10 and in other passages that God is considered to be a just God. There's nothing unjust about him. He's not morally corrupt. He's not morally found wanting. Also, scripture tells us that God's very throne is founded upon. The, found, the foundations of his throne are justice and righteousness. And you're going to see me through today interchange these two words, righteousness and justice, because they are closely linked. In fact, one is the result of, another, of the other. And this means that God is perfectly righteous in his treatment of his creatures. Psalm 89, you can look at this in your own time, and I, I do recommend you to have a look. Psalm 89 Verse 14 says the following. Listen to this. Psalm 89 verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love 
and faithfulness go before you. Did you hear that? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. This tells us that righteousness and justice, that this means that these virtues are the basis of God's divine government. God rules based upon this. God's government is based upon justice and righteousness like any true kingdom is. He is never unjust or unwise. And in general Greek usage, the word justification was the terminology of the courtroom relating to a judicial hearing or divine acquittal. When, when you acquit somebody is when you let them go. You cancel the, the charge against that person. So when we use the word justification in the context of salvation, we're not saying that you and I or the guilty person is innocent. Not at all. What we're saying is this, is that it's a forensic term. You are declared not guilty. Not because you're not guilty. Oh, you are very guilty. Absolutely guilty. Divine CCTV evidence, you are guilty. DNA, everything. You and I, absolutely, perfectly guilty. As God is perfectly righteous, we are perfectly sinful but we are declared not guilty. We'll come back to this at the end. Now, first of all, before we carry on, I want us to address some misunderstandings about justification. This is very important. I want you to keep hold of this as we go on. One of the ones I want to deal with, and I want, you to, I want to use as an example, the Roman Catholic understanding of justification. And this is why we had the Protestant Reformation. Please, I don't mean to beat down if anyone's from a Catholic background, what have you, but please understand clearly so you know the difference and why we have evangelicalism or Protestantism and then it's Roman Catholicism. And the reason why we say the two can't meet is because of this doctrine of justice. Well, the other reasons, but this is a central issue. Because of this very doctrine, depending on what you believe, will determine whether you are truly believing the gospel or not. So the Roman Catholicism understanding of justification is this. Cooperation between man and God. Cooperation between man and God. And the point is this. In that kind of understanding... They believe that you and I are to attain enough righteousness as we go through life. By doing good works, we build up up a record to attain enough righteousness to enter heaven, to enter God's kingdom. That's their believing. This is called, this is this word, infused righteousness. Infused righteousness righteousness. What do I mean by infused? In other words, in each and every one of us, and you're going to see in a minute when I describe it, that this is what people generally believe, even even non-Christians. Infused righteousness means that planted in each single human being is this seed of righteousness. And all we have to do is to work hard. Work on it. Build up the record of righteousness to attain enough and shop. We're okay with God. The problem is this. With that kind of understanding of righteousness, one depends on himself. You're depending on your ability to do something. That cannot be the gospel. You know why? Because we're not all made equal. Because if, you, if, if, if the standard for righteousness was to have a PhD, many of us in there would struggle. If it was about running the 100 meter dash, 
in under 15 seconds. Whew. Many of us would struggle. Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> but you see, if it's dependent on something natural to you, it cannot be of God. It's dependent on you. And if that's the case, this will produce arrogance and boasting. The very thing that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, that there can be no boasting. Paul went so far in Philippians chapter 3 to call people who believe in themselves and in their own ability, he called them dogs. Also, not only does it produce arrogance and boasting, it produces fear. Am I good enough? Am I good enough? Did I do good enough today? Let me check my meter. How many points did I score today? Whew. And you go through life like that. No rest, no peace. Always full of anxiety. Am I right with God? Am I right with God? Am I right with God? Well, I was right with God yesterday, but I'm not sure about today. But it also encourages selfishness. Because when you do good works, you're not doing it because of the benefit of that person. You're doing it so you can score points. You don't care about God's glory. You don't really care about that other person. You're doing it actually for yourself. Do you see the problem? But the big problem is this. The big problem is this. To be really righteous before God, you've got to be perfect. Perfect. That, that's the main problem. We can't be perfect. You know why? We saw it last week. By our very nature, we fail. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Romans chapter 3, we saw last week. All of sin have fallen short of God's glory. In other words, we've fallen short of God's standard. We can never meet it. We can never attain it. It's impossible. We see it with Mormons. I told you last week. Mormons believe... If this is the standard for the righteousness God wants, you and I are to try hard, really try hard, and see how far we can get. And whatever's left, Jesus makes up the rest. That's not biblical righteousness. That's not biblical justice. And other religions are the same. Try hard, work hard, depend on yourself. That's why you see some people... They go and sit half naked on a mountain somewhere in a lotus position or sit on top of a pole or they fast and fast and fast and all of these things because they believe they can somehow appease God by their own efforts. All of these is what we call infused righteousness. You believe there's something inherently good in you. You just need to try harder and then you get there. This is not biblical. This is not true. What the Bible presents to us is what we call, listen to very carefully to this word, imputed righteousness. So we've got infused righteousness. Uh-uh, wrong. But the biblical term is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Never forget that word, people. And impute, to impute, is a business language. Like a bank. Like in a bank. You transfer from this account to that account. You impute from this account to that account. You transfer money. I hope, I always hope, one day I'll wake up and somebody's imputed a hundred million rand into my account. Hey, pray yours, I'll pray mine. I'm joking, I'm not fake chasing money. But that's the idea. It's meant to convey a bank transaction from one account to the other. It's also known as what we call alien righteousness. It's something that's outside of you. The word alien is not just the stuff you see on TV. Alien means something from another place. Martin Luther was the one that coined the term alien righteousness. It's not righteousness from us. It's righteousness from outside of us. And Paul speaks of this when using Abraham as an example when he was referring, remember Genesis chapter 15 verse 6, 
when God said to Abraham, look up. And he looked up in the sky and he believed, he said. And what does the Bible say? It was counted to him as what? Righteousness. It was imputed to him as righteousness. And Paul rightly knows that it was Abraham's faith that caused him to be justified before God, not the keeping of the law or performing good works. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 4 quickly, please. Romans 4. There's going to be a lot of turning back and forth. Like I said, in this series, we're bringing together many parts from Scripture to understand these doctrines. Romans 4. First of all, look at verse 3. Romans 4, verse 3. What do we find there? It says this. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as what? Righteousness. Jump down to verse 22. From verse 22 to 25. Here's what we find there. And this is beautiful. Look at this. Romans chapter 4, verse 22 to 25. Paul writes... That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, or the King James, I like the King James says, imputed to him. Imputed to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone. Do you hear that? This isn't just for him. Why, Paul? Why wasn't it just written for Abraham's sake alone? Read on. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised him from the de- who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Paul expands this application to all of us. God imputes, counts righteousness to Christians who do not possess any righteousness themselves just like Abraham that's why those who are children of Abraham are not those who are born Jewish line but those what does the Bible present those who are like believing Abraham who believe like Abraham they are counted the children of Abraham this is the right understanding of justification But it raises an important question or questions. If this is the case, is God unfair? Is God unfair? Why do I I ask this? You see, some people ask, how can God send people to hell when they have never heard about Jesus? Because this is all well and good, Joshua, this justification, preaching the gospel, but How can God send anyone to hell if they've never heard this gospel? If they don't know about Jesus? And they ask this because they they rightly understand if faith in Jesus is necessary, what about people who have never heard the gospel? And here's the thing, I'm going to shock you. The Bible never explicitly addresses this. The Bible never explicitly addresses this. Do you want to know why? While the Bible doesn't explicitly address this, but, but the Bible addresses a greater problem. What that is, is this. Here's what the Bible addresses. How can a holy and just God allow a sinner to enter his kingdom? That's the right question you should be asking. How can this God allow anyone, anyone, to enter his kingdom? Because we cannot meet his standard. So how can he even allow anyone, you, me, how? Does he do this? You see, we're very good at asking the other question. 
But we don't ask the question that the Bible's really asking. The question that's making them go crazy. People like Paul saying, we can't believe it. Listen, my brothers and sisters, where the Bible is going wow, you need to be going wow. Because that's what the New Testament and the rest of Scripture again and again is going, we can't believe, we can't. this is amazing. Why would God do this? Why would this holy and just God justify sinners that are guilty? That's what's defining justice. Injustice, what we mean by that is this, a corrupt or incompetent judge that sends innocent people to prison. That's how we usually understand a corrupt judge. Someone who sends the innocent people to prison. Equally, an unjust and incompetent judge lets the guilty person go free, right? You don't seem convinced. I'm worried. A good judge, or sorry, an unjust um, judge, the less a a, a good to go free, is corrupt. And we're all happy, (laughs) if we're the guilty one to be let free, right? We're all happy with that. We don't question it, do we? If we're happy, it raises the question, is God corrupt? Is he unjust? So today, here's what we do. We put God in court and accuse him of being unfair and corrupt by the questions we ask. Now, it's good to ask these questions if we're learning and it leads us to a better understanding. But what most of us do and the world does is to pontificate, in other words, to stand morally over God. Well, if I was God, I wouldn't allow this. Well, if I was God, I would do this. Well, if I was God, I would... Well, you're not God. That's your problem. And thank God it's it's not our problem. C.S. Lewis put it brilliantly. Look at this quote by C.S. Lewis. The ancient man approached God, even the gods, as the accused approaches his judge, because he understands I'm guilty, so let me tentatively approach this judge, because I know I'm guilty. And he continues, for the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. The ancients understood rightly. We're messed up people. We've done something wrong. But today, we stand in judgment of God. Who is he to tell me what to do? Who is he? Who is he? How dare God do that? Why doesn't he do this? We stand in judgment of God. I want you to remember our previous message. Remember last week we touched in Romans chapter 3. That every part of our being our tongue, our feet, our actions, the way we see the world, everything is corrupted. Everything is corrupted. If I asked you to measure something with a crooked measuring tool, it would be impossible, wouldn't it? But that's you and I standing in judgment of God. We're crooked, we're bent, We're corrupt. And yet somehow we think we can pontificate over God. See church, we need to ask. The right question is, how can a holy God let sinners go free? Look at Romans chapter 3. Verse 25. Verse 26. Romans chapter 3. Verse 25b it reads, actually read verse 25. Whom God put forward as a propitiation, that's Jesus Christ, by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his div- divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
Now, I actually prefer, and actually look, stay there actually. Look at verse 5 of chapter 4. It's Romans chapter 4. Stay in Romans there. Look at verse 5. It says this. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is imputed or counted as righteousness. I like the way the NIV put it. Who justifies the wicked? Who justifies the wicked? Church, this is the only option. Listen very carefully. Either God condemns the wicked or he acquits him. Either he condemns us or he lets us go. Those are the options according to this. You see, the Jews believed that God would be unjust to to pass over people's sins and not deal with it. You don't let the wicked go. You deal with the wicked. You judge them. You kill them. And if God was to pass over their sins, he's been unjust. That's the point of Romans 3, verse 25 to 26 we just read. But you see, I think part of the reason we have these problems of understanding what God has done and is doing through this teaching of justification is that we don't truly understand grace. We don't understand grace. You see... We Christians, we speak grace, we speak about grace, we sing about grace, we teach about grace, we try to live grace, but then we turn on God for justly and rightly condemning sinners. How can God send anybody to hell? When we ask that question, we don't understand grace. Because what we're saying is this. We're, we're actually not bad people. We're inherently good. There's something good in us. Who wouldn't love me? That's the way we think. I want you to imagine something. One night, three identical robbers, identical triplets. What are the chances? Three identical triplets break into my house. Okay? Okay? They break into my house. And I happen to apprehend them. The first guy, I hand him over to the police. The second guy, I say to him, if you work for me for 40 hours, I'll let you go free. And the third one, I just let him go. Here's my question. Which one of them did I show grace to? Feel free, tell me. First, second, or third? Those who think the first guy, show me by your hands. No one? What about second guy? Did I show him grace? Okay, well, we're good. Third guy? Actually, those of you that raise your hand for the second, you're right as well. But it's not biblical grace, but you're right. Because I said to him, if you work for me for 40 hours, I'll let you go. Because he's not getting the punishment he deserves, does he? So the second and the third guy, I've shown grace. Let me ask you this question. Is this unfair? (laughs) Am I being unfair? No. There is only justice and grace. This is the gospel. I have the right to. I'm the one that's offended. I can never give him the judgment he deserves. I can let him go free. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us that we deserve death. Right? Look at it. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. I've told people, I always use this passage in evangelism. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Memorize this. It's good. You can, I, I could preach the gospel from Genesis to Revelation from this passage. This verse. Romans six twenty three says... For the wages of sin is what? Death. That's what we're deserving of. Because God said to Adam, in the day you eat of it, you will what? Surely die. The wages of sin is death. 
So God is never unjust. That's our default position. We're under God's judgment and wrath already. Always. But what does the second part of the verse say? But the free gift. I love it. Not just the gift. But the free gift of God is eternal life in yourself. Amen. No? Sorry, is that Joshua version again? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are given life as a free gift. Because of Christ. Church, we should be amazed that God saves anyone. Not only are we undeserving of God's salvation. Church, listen to this. Not only are we undeserving of God's salvation, we are equally undeserving to hear the gospel message. You see, you don't seem convinced again. Hmm, what is he saying there? Hearing the gospel message is God's act of mercy and grace. There is nowhere where God is obligated to save you. He's not obligated to let it even let you hear the gospel. Nowhere is he obligated to do so. You and I are both undeserving of salvation and undeserving of hearing the gospel. Grace is the basis of our assurance before God. Do you see how we sing it? It's not dependent upon my performance. The God who saved you today knew exactly what you're going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, next decade. He knew he knows everything perfect. This is why Psalm 139 is amazing. God, amazing God, who knows all things, knows your heart, still has chosen to set his affections upon you. And we, we struggle with this, balancing justice and grace. You see, the triplets that broke into my house, my judgment wasn't based upon how they looked because they're all look the same by the way if you break into my house I will not show you grace <laughs> just so, in case anyone listen to this or anyone here who's got designs I've, I've warned you I will not show you grace but it's not based upon how they look or anything it's based upon what my choice not anything about them but my choice very important. But I wanted to, to go back to the opening story. Let's go back to the opening story. You see, the king had, had two options if he wanted to maintain the justice of his throne. Either punish his mother according to the decree of the, of the law, of his own law, or make someone else pay for it. And if he made somebody else pay for it, it's, that's un, being unjust. The soul of sins will what? Will die. You pay for your own sins, thank you. But like we said, there's a third option. He paid the penalty himself. And thus, he displayed both grace by acquitting his mother and justice. The penalty of the law was met. When he had his own hand cut off. And this way, no one could accuse the king of being corrupt. No one could question his integrity because he cut off his own hand. Similarly, God cannot overlook sins. He cannot overlook our sins. And if God had punished someone else... He was to be considered unjust. But God had a third option for you and me. God himself pays the penalty. This is true grace. He paid the penalty himself. But what about the law and good works, you may ask. If you're asking that, you should be asking that. What about the law and good works? Don't they matter? 
You see, here's our misunderstanding, church, for those of us who are familiar with, 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 with the whole of Scripture. You see, we usually think that the guys in the Old Testament were made righteous by obeying the law. Yeah, they had to obey the law, but they weren't made righteous by their obedience of the law. No, it's always been by grace through faith. Always. Abraham was justified by faith. So was the other, so were the other Old Testament saints. They were all justified by faith. This is why Paul speaks of the curse of the law in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 13. For all who rely on works of the law are For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith, rather the one who does shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, come in a curse for us, for it is written, who is hanged on a tree. This Paul is making is this. The way to be made perfect or righteous law is to do what? To obey it perfectly. If you broke any part of the law, you did what? A lawbreaker. Again, back to our Ferrari. So imagine you're driving to Johannesburg in your Ferrari. And we know the speed limit is what? 120, right? 120. But you're driving a Ferrari, for goodness sakes. Who does 120 in a Ferrari? Amen. <laughs> so you're doing 220, right? Or 280 or something. And you're driving it, you're licking it down to Joburg. Instead of two and a half hours, you're doing it in an hour. And just before you get to the, the, the city limits of Joburg, you get stopped by a speed cop. And a speed cop is like, do you know you are doing 280? And you respond and say, yeah, I, I know, but I'm a really good father and a really good husband. And I pay my taxes. I'm really, you know, I, I give to the poor. I'm a really nice person. I go to church on Sundays, etc., etc. The speed cop doesn't care. You broke the law. You're, you're a lawbreaker. Whether you've kept 99 out of 100, if you break that one law, you are a lawbreaker. And that's what Paul is saying here. We're lawbreakers. We can't keep the, the only way you are made righteous or justified by the law is for you to keep it perfectly. And we know we can't do that. If you've ever lied once in your life, and that's the only sin you've ever committed, you're a lawbreaker. But you have another problem. We saw it last week. By your nature, you're in trouble. So you can't do this. But that's why then Paul writes, look at Galatians 2. Go back, Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse 16. Look at what Paul writes in verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Listen to this, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Jump down to verse 21 of chapter 2. Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. You see that with only Jesus. If you and I can be made righteous or justified by the works of the law, then Jesus died for nothing. But we can't. That's what Paul is saying. In your own time, in your own time, please look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 21 and 22 as well. In fact, just read the whole of Galatians. It speaks on all of this. See, Paul is saying is this. If the law kills, and you see this in Romans chapter 7 verse 12, why does Paul refer to the law as good? Paul refers to the law as being good. But yet he tells us at the same time, the law kills. Do you know why? 
Because the purpose of the law was to reveal our need for grace. The law was to reveal to us that we can't do this alone. It is impossible. That's why in Galatians chapter 3 verse 24, and I'm reading from the NIV version because it, puts it, it gets this right. Paul says, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. All the law does is to show you and I we are incapable of keeping God's law. We need grace. And the Old Testament teaches salvation has always been by faith. And in Romans chapter 4, Paul gives us the example of, of Abraham, of David, and Habakkuk, showing us this has always been the case. But let me bring all this to a close for us. There's a legal tra transaction that happened through Jesus Christ. You see, here's the problem. You and I could never meet and can never meet the requirements of the law. Okay? We can't meet the requirements of the law. So God sent his son, Jesus. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 tells us, who was born under the law. And this Jesus was placed in our situation. He flawlessly obeyed the righteous requirement of God's law that you and I could not obey. And scripture teaches us that this Jesus, through his perfect obedience, he maintained a righteousness that you and I could never produce. But here's the thing, Jesus did not only come to fulfill the law, he himself is the very fulfillment of that law. That's why in Luke chapter 24 we're told that he's on the road to Emmaus. He explained to the disciples from the scripture how he is the fulfillment of the law himself. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 to 14 tells us that the law slayed us, killed us. It condemned us. But Jesus paid the debt. Jesus wiped the debt clean. Jesus dealt with the charges against us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14. Please do read that. Paul says the handwriting against you and I was dealt with by Jesus on the cross. You see why this is significant? Because this has to, this, this doctrine of justification deals with our actions, the things we do. And these things we do, we do because we're sinners and it counts against us. And the problem is this, the things we do are not good enough to meet God's requirement. So, through Jesus Christ, righteousness was imputed to our account. You see, let me give an illustration. Imagine you and I have a debt like ESCOM, right? So it's 400 billion rand in debt. We are 400 billion rand in debt. And then someone cancels the debt. That's good, right? But here's your problem. What, what does your bank balance say? Zero. You've got nothing to offer. But now, imagine the person that, count, that, that counseled your debt, that paid your debt, not only do they pay your debt, they transfer into your account, they impute into your account, they transfer into your account 400 billion rand. Now you could do something with that, couldn't you? That's what's happened. Not only has our debt been wiped clean, but we have a righteousness that meets God's standard. Not ours, but an alien righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. Isaiah 53 verse 11 wonderfully speaks, back, speaks about this. Please read that in your own time. 
So remember I told you last week, at the end of each one of these, these sessions on these doctrines, we will look at, so why does this matter, question. Well, this matters because of this. The legal language of salvation is further found in two words. You find in the New Testament and the Greek. One of those words is this, accuser. Accuser. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8, Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. In fact, you find it about 34 times in the New Testament. And it relates to Satan. He's called what? The accuser, isn't he? Satan is called the accuser. That's what it means. He's the accuser. He's the accuser of the brothers. Scripture tells us that he stands before God and he demands that you and I be punished. He's constantly going, look, look what he's doing. Look at him. Look. Don't you see that? Look. That's all he does. He's the accuser. But we have another word. It's the word intercessor. Intercessor. We saw that when we read Hebrews earlier today. Please go back to that passage, Hebrews chapter 7. And we sung it in our first song. What does the word intercessor mean? It means this. Listen very carefully, church. Don't ever forget this. So when Satan accuses us, Jesus intercedes for us. You know what? Hebrews 7, verse 23 to 25. I'll read it. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He lives. He lives to make intercession for you and I. I don't think we fully appreciate this. This is an amazing promise. See, when Satan accuses sinners day and night, day and night, that's what we're told in Revelations, day and night, he accuses us before God. Jesus is interceding for them. Jesus intercedes for us. Hallelujah. This is why Paul writes what he does in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Paul says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I want you to imagine a court scene, church. Back to the court. You and I, believers, are the defendants. Okay? We are the defendants. God the Father is seated as the judge. Jesus Christ is the defense attorney. And Satan is the chief prosecutor. Church, with every accusation, Jesus steps in and intervenes. Church, listen very carefully. Jesus is not stating on our behalf that we are innocent. Not at all. He intercedes by taking upon himself the punishment we deserve. That's what it means for Jesus to intercede for us. But you know what? In what other way did Jesus intercede for us? Not just in Satan accusing us. Do you know the other problem is this? God is a holy judge and he must judge sin. He intercedes for us when God's judgment comes. He stood on the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But because he experienced that, Today, you and I can say, my God, my God, why have you not forsaken me? The abandonment he experienced, you and I will never have to experience it 
Because Jesus took the punishment, the wrath of God upon all unforgiven sins on the cross. In that way, he intercedes for us continuously. Good works are a product of saving faith, not a requirement of it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Read that in your own time. This is why the Apostle Paul, again in Romans chapter 1, said, There is therefore now no condemnation. So when you and I die, when we stand before God, we will not have to give an answer for anything. You know why? Because Jesus has interceded and has answered every question on our behalf. But more than that, he's taken the punishment that you deserve on himself. Keep this in mind. Remember this? Regeneration. Our hearts were bad. We needed what? A new heart. Our nature condemned us. We looked at this last week. That's our problem. But regeneration addresses the power of sin in our lives. There's nothing we can do about it. It's a declaration of the Creator in Him giving you new life. But justification deals with this. Our record is bad. Our criminal record is terrible. There's nothing we can do to expunge that record. It stands against us. Back to Colossians chapter 2. But Jesus wiped that record clean. So our actions condemned us. What we do is never good enough. And justification addresses the penalty of sin. We deserve death. We deserve punishment. We deserve hell. But Praise God, because Jesus intercedes for us. We never have to serve a day in hell. And this is an act of a gracious judge. That's justification. Regeneration, justification. Do you see already how much God has done for us? New nature, new creation, perfect righteousness. Praise God. So, I'm hoping you and I, I want you to understand that your good works do not save you. They should be the product of this saving work, completed work of Christ. We do good works, not to score points, but as an act of love and worship to God. Good works do not save us. So when you leave this place today, you go out there, understand this. You live this life of holiness because of that which Christ has done for you. It's a life that says, thank you God for this great salvation. You will never be good enough on your own. But trust in the finished work of Christ. In that, you stand justified. Don't worry tomorrow, you fail tomorrow. Don't worry if you fail next week. Don't worry if you fail next month. Don't worry. You stand justified before your creator. Because the only one who can judge you has said, not guilty. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this great truth of justification. Thank you, Father God, that you have done something for us that we could never do ourselves. And there are many people laboring out there, trying to be good, trying hard. But they need to hear this message. And even hearing the message, Lord, is an act of grace. This is why we as believers should have the urgency amongst us to make you known to a lost and a dying world. So Lord, help us have an urgency about making you known. And that, Lord, as we do these good works to understand that it's not earning any points or credits with you, but it's an act of love, an act of obedience, an act of, an act of appreciation for what you have done for us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.